Hello everybody, Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This Bible study is going to be on what are the duties and obligations of man, or what does God want from us? Well, King Solomon, who the Bible records as being the wisest man that ever lived, records the following in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, and verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Good advice. I kind of like uh, Exodus 34, 14. People always ask me, oh, what's the name of God? And, you know, people will say, well, it's Yahweh, it's Yahuwah, uh, Yehovah, Jehovah, Yahweh. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know Hebrew, and I'm not even sure, you know, if, if anybody on this earth really knows the name of the Lord. But in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 14, we read the following. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, did you catch that? whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Huh. The Bible says his name is Jealous. And, uh, you know, when you really love somebody and you want a one-on-one -on -one relationship, well, guess what? And they start messing around with somebody else. Don't you get jealous? You know, these people that have so-called open marriages... They really don't care about each other. They really don't. I've known some people like that, and it's just convenient for them. But the Lord, he actually loves us, loves us, and he's a jealous God. In Psalms 111, 111, verse 9, we read the following. He sent redemption unto his people, the whole world? No, his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. That's a long time, people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend, reverend is his name. Did you know that God's, uh, it says holy and reverend is his name? So every time I see somebody that's running around with a clerical collar and they call themselves reverend, do you realize they're calling themselves by a name of God? Oh, yeah. Hey, reverend so-and-so. Uh, that's why I, yeah. You know, I call myself a chaplain. I'm ordained. whoop de doo But uh, they, everybody will say, well, you know, where's chaplain in the Bible? It's not, but the word Bible's not in the Bible either. But, uh, you know, uh, a chapel is very similar to a church. But uh, a chapel's just a place where people go for worship that's not technically a church. Like they have chapels in hospitals. Hospitals not actually a church, although the great majority of churches in the United States were originally created by uh, Bible-believing groups. Of course, they have been taken over by the Antichrist, if you catch my drift. But uh, and chaplain comes from the same root word as chapel, so I don't know. Just a little 
education there. All right, let's keep going. All right, this is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus recorded in the fourth chapter of Luke, and we're going to start in verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So I guess he'd, uh, he had just been baptized by John the Baptist, and uh, now he's starting his ministry. Verse 2, being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That's some good advice, huh? And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Must have paled in comparison to what Christ, when he left heaven to come to earth, you know, <laughs> comparing the kingdoms of this world to heaven. Eh, I don't think that's much of a comparison, but uh, I've never been to heaven, and I don't know what it looks like, but, uh, yeah, you know, use your imagination, right? And showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Well, I imagine God gave Satan a lease for a certain period of time, but uh, I imagine the lease is getting ready to run out. And I don't think the landlord's going to renew it. What do you think? Verse 8. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, Cast thyself down from hence, for it is written. Now, here's Satan quoting Scripture. You know what's really sad is Satan knows Scripture better than your average churchgoer. That's what's really sad, you know, really is. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. All right, let's hit John chapter 4. I guess we'll go to verse 1. This is an interesting chapter. I've read it a number of times in my studies. Sometimes I read the same things and put different... I, uh, I guess you could say it's like a slant. Um, but uh, let's get going. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. 
Now, Samaria was the capital of northern Israel, whereas Jerusalem was the capital of southern Judah. And your average demon nominational preacher will never tell you this because they want you to think that um, a group of people in the Middle East are all that exists of Israel. They don't want you to know that Israel and Judah were two separate people and that they had different kings, different capitals, and actually fought wars against each other. So, I mean, to make the distinction of difference, well, oh, that would require, you know, some studying. And God forbid we don't want to do that. I mean, you know, somebody asks a Bible question, you know, oh, hey, pastor, does, does the Lord love everybody? And he'll just quote John 3.16. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, God loves everybody. But they won't read Malachi chapter 1 where he said he hated Esau. And I'm sure Esau hated God and God was just returning the favor, I suppose. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, they don't want you... They want you to have just enough knowledge, to have just enough faith, so that you throw some bucks into the collection plate when it goes by, but they don't want you to have enough knowledge that you find out that a lot of what they teach is lies. So, verse 5, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. Now, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. All his 12 of his sons were the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And he had a well there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings, with the Samaritans. Now, if you don't know why, the answer is in Jer Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8. God divorced Israel, but he didn't divorce Judah. Take a look. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8. Boy, I tell you what, show, you, you bring that up in a Bible study on your denominational church and start asking questions and saying, well, you know, God divorced Israel. Oh boy, that'll get you told, don't you, uh, you're trespassing, get out of here, go, don't ever come back. Because they don't want the flock to know this stuff. You know, it's either you believe what we tell you to believe or the highway. We don't care what the Bible says. So why did the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? They were divorced from God from the covenant. But when you read in the book of Hosea, God promised that he would make a new covenant with not just the house of Judah, but with the house of Israel too. And Christ fulfilled that promise. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, shoot me an email, send me a, uh, make a comment. I'll direct you to the video where I go into this in detail. Matter of fact, it's a series called You Only Have I Known. I believe it's a three-part series. Well worth reading. For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest, knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, 
thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hath thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, people? You see, this woman, she asked him, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel? She was an Israelite, people. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Did Jesus tell her, no, you're not an Israelite? No, he didn't say that. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. There you go, people. Verse 15, The woman said unto him, saith unto him, Sir, give me this water to drink. Oh, I'm sorry. Give, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus saith unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. Boy, she was busy, huh? I wonder how that happened. How do you get five husbands? Uh, maybe they were all extremely old. I don't know. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that sayest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Ah, worship. Very important, right? Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And uh, we're talking about the real Jews, the tribe of Judah, not the sin of Gog of Satan, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9, that only claim to be. So, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit, in spirit and in in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Did you know that God the Father seeks us to worship him? Oh, yeah. He wants us to love him just as much as we love, uh, so that we love him just as much as he loves us, if that's even possible. I don't even know if it's possible. Uh, I did so many stupid things. And, yeah, I can see why the Lord, uh, why Paul was talking about um, defiling the flesh. You know, we're spirit beings. And we just have a flesh body for now. So, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Very important.
The woman saith unto him, I know that Messias cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. All right, everybody, let's go to Revelation chapter 14. I guess we'll read from verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. Now, if you don't know it, um, John the Baptist, when he saw Christ, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You know, the thing is, uh, a lot of people say that, oh, well, you know, they read Revelation and they say, well, you know, I don't understand it, they'll tell you. Well, that's because Revelation grabs all its symbolism from the rest of the Bible. A lot of it from the Old Testament. Matter of fact, most of it comes from the Old Testament. And if you've never read the entire Bible, the symbolism just, you know, you, you won't catch what the symbolism means. You know? I mean, let's face it. Uh, first Passover, they had to sacrifice a lamb. And then John tells you Jesus was that lamb. So, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. I think I would rather have the father's name written in my forehead rather than 666, the mark of the beast. What do you think? And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Um, that's not going to be me, because I don't have a musical bone in my body. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. That won't be me either. I got a terrible voice. Of course, the Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I can do that. But uh, you sure don't want me singing, that's for sure. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed deemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women. Well, that counts me out. For they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God, and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. How long is that gospel? Everlasting. To preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. Do you know, you know that word nation? It's the same word that they translate as Gentile. So, verse 7. Here's the punchline. So here it is, the angels flying, saying with a loud voice, right? Fear God and give glory to him. Give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. In the end times, you're going to have a choice. Worship the beast or worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. One loves you and the other hates you. Take your pick. All right, let's uh, take a look at some Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. Now the King James translators took the name of the Lord and translated it as Lord. 
and people argue and say, well, you know, eh, that's not right, this and that and the other. But the thing is, uh, this is what the sacred name movement is all about. Uh, people will argue incessantly over how to pronounce the name of God. And honestly, I don't know if anybody's got it right. You know, I think it's foolish. Maybe the, the King James translators didn't know either and just decided to make it Lord just instead of making a wrong guess. I don't know. But we read, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Boy, you could make an entire Bible study on just giving glory to the Lord. Matter of fact, it's just... Whew. Psalms 29, verse 1, a Psalm of David. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. First Chronicles 16, 28. Give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of the people, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Psalms 96, 7. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people, give unto the Lord glory and strength. So we're supposed to give our strength unto the Lord. Psalms 115, verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Huh. So, give glory unto the Lord. Um, I could read giving glory to the Lord uh, probably a, a hundred times, but I, I hope you get the idea. First Chronicles 16.29 Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Huh. Psalms 30 and verse 12. To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee. Huh, sing praise. To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. So, do we have any glory to give God? No. All we can do is recognize his glory. We can sing his praises, and we can give thanks. That's more duties. That's, that's our duty in life. Uh, Psalms 84 and verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So, we're supposed to walk uprightly. You know, everybody's all worried about this coronavirus. And, you know, that's the thing. I should have died a number of times. Even when I was... I, don't, I wouldn't say I hated God, but... I did none of the things that I'm t I've talked about today, and yet he protected me. Uh, there's a bunch of different times I should have died. I can think of several just off the top of my head. Um, boy, I, I can think of a few. I'm surprised. I'm surprised I didn't burn out. But uh, I guess... Well, I know he had other plans.
Jeremiah 13.6 Give glory to the Lord your God before he cause darkness, and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. And while ye look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death, and make it gross darkness. Here's an interesting verse. Judges chapter 5 and verse 3. You know what, people? Read the book of Judges sometime and read it very carefully. It's coming to America, basically, and Europe. Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes. I, even I, will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Second Samuel 22.4 I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Believe me, people, we have enemies on this earth. Oh, yeah. First Chronicles 16.25 For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. Second Chronicles 7, 3. Chapter 7, verse 3. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, uh, this is the temple of Solomon, they bowed themselves with their faces to the crown upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord saying for he is good for his mercy endureth forever good thing for me boy I'll tell you it's a good thing he has mercy and good thing it lasts forever because I'd be in trouble now I know I've beaten this to death but I've got to uh, assume that somebody's a new listener so let's go to Matthew chapter 22. I consider this one of the most important paragraphs in the Bible. Matthew 22, verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him, Jesus, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You know what, people, when you hear these um, people that are, you know, Hebrew roots, so-called people, and they'll they hate Paul, and they hate the one that called Paul, which was uh, Jesus himself, and then they'll say all of Paul's writings are no good, which is close to half of the New Testament, and then they'll deny the Book of Acts, and then they'll deny Second Peter, and by the time you're done. You're an antichrist. Because they'll say, oh, Paul changed the law. No, he didn't. Jesus changed the law. But they don't really believe in Jesus. They believe in Ye Yeshua. Which, uh... <laughs> you know what's interesting? Hebrew has no vowels. So if you take Y-E-S-H-U-A, Yeshua, which they say that really means Joshua, which is the sixth book in the Bible. And then you take Yeshu, Y-E-S-H-U, which is what the Antichrists use as a curse. It's an acronym that basically means, may his name be blotted out from under heaven. But when you do that in Hebrew, 
there's no vowels. So there's really no difference between Yeshu and Yeshua in the Hebrew. Well, probably Yiddish, but you know. But the point is, Jesus changed the law, not Paul. Jesus did. You know, really, people? All right, let's go to 1 John chapter 4. And I think I'm going to use this as the conclusion verse. I think we're going to read the whole chapter. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Why is that? Well, because there's good spirits and there's bad spirits, right? Beloved, believe not every spirit. Boy, somebody send a, a, a memo to the uh, Mormon church, will ya? Beloved, believe not every spirit. Oh, and by the way, the Mormon church started because of a, an angel or a spirit named M-O-R-O-N, Moron, I. M-O-R-O-N, I. <laughs> they call him Moron, Moroni. What they ought to do is call him Moron, I. But in English, you read from left to right. But in Hebrew, you read from right to left. So, Moroni, or Moron, I, if you read it like the in the Hebrew, uh, it would be I, Moron. Yeah, because this angel came down and told Joseph Smith, blah, 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 and they made a new religion out of it. But they forgot to do this. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try or test, test, you know, try or test, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth us, heareth not us. Where uh, hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest, manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, what does it mean to propitiation? In Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which um, you can't go wrong with this book, uh, the guy spoke over 20 languages fluently. The guy was a genius. He wasn't just a translator. He was a linguist, which is a a language scholar. He knew the root words. Uh, he knew the original languages of the Bible, uh, Hebrew and Greek. He also knew knew Latin. I mean, guy could you know, 
he knew a lot, and he standardized the spelling. Uh, but propitiation means the act of appeasing wrath and conciliating the favor of an offended person. Uh, in theology, the atonement or atoning sacrifice offered to God um, to soften his wrath. So, appeasing wrath and trying to get the favor. So, let's go back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And yes, I confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Verse 16. And we know and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Now, there's a difference, people, between judgment and wrath. Okay? Um, if a father catches his son stealing and lying about it, and he spanks him and punishes him, that's judgment. But there's a difference between judgment and wrath. Judgment's punishment. Wrath is final, eternal punishment. You know, judgment's a spanking. Wrath is final. Uh, Satan's going to be the object of God's wrath. But the church is going to be judged. There's a difference. And I just ran across somebody t today in the comments section of a, a one of the videos that I commented on where they said, oh, judgment and wrath is the same thing, and we're not, the church isn't, you know, we're not going to be judged. What? Uh, you know, I wonder, are these people ignorant or are they deceivers? I, I don't know. But I made the distinction, and that's all I can do. And if YouTube censors my comments, well, God allowed it. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Verse 18. There is no fear in love. See, when you love God perfectly, that thing about, you know, fear God and it's irrelevant. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Boy, is that the truth? We love him because he, God, because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? And this commanded have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Are we talking about a physical brother or a spiritual brother? 
How about I go out on a limb and say both? Well, people, I think I gave you a good introduction. Um, so, you know, obedience, praise, worship, give glory and honor, and love. Those are basically our duties to the Lord. And you know, if you love the Lord and love your neighbor, hang, that hangs all the law and the prophets. You can't do any better than that. So, Chaplain Bob signing off. All blessings, glory, praise, and honor to the Lamb of God sworn, slain from the foundation of the world. The only begotten of God the Father, all blessings, praise, and glory and honor to God the Father too. In Jesus' precious name, amen.